Hello, welcome to my channel. Today we have missing Stephen Lancaster Cox. I don't know why he has two names, but he does. Middle initial M doesn't say what it stands for. Uh, date of last contact, November 18, 2004. He was 38 years old. He went missing from Ackworth, Georgia. 6'1 to 6'3, 170 to 185 pounds. There's a picture of him. Wow. Last seen at about 10 p.m., leaving his home in the vicinity of Walden Lane in Ackworth, Georgia. Brown, curly hair, blue eyes, metal screws in left elbow, pierced left ear, scar about six inches long on left elbow, Tattoo of a rose on upper chest. Tattoo of a crown of thorns around upper left arm. Jeans, checkered dress shirt over blue t-shirt. Boxer underwear. Harley Davidson boots. The boots were found on January 1st, 2005, about one mile from my home. Who's saying one mile from my home? One mile from a whose home? Uh, uh, pinky ring with small tiger eye. One mile from whose home? Is that his home? Um, transportation 1988 Ford Thunderbird sedan, black and silver. He did not drive the car. It was left at his mother's home. Well, then why are they bringing it up? Why is that car mentioned as like... It, be, usually they only mention the car if the car went missing or he didn't drive the car. Why are they mentioning it? Okay, so we go to GBI, Stephen Lancaster Cox. Location 3665 Walden Lane, Ackworth, Georgia. Six foot one, 170 pounds, brown hair, blue eyes. On the evening of November 18, 2004, Stephen Steve Lancaster Cox was at his mother's home, 3665 Walden Lane, Ackworth, Georgia, when he received a call from an unknown person. During the call, Cox was overheard by his mother to say that he saw the lights of a vehicle pulling into the drive. Cox left the residence with the unknown person, was never heard from or seen again. He was 38 years old when he disappeared. Investigation revealed that he may have been planning, may have been planning a robbery of a gaming establishment in Cobb County, Georgia, which is like Marietta area. Um, on the night Cox disappeared, the game room attendant reported a suspicious person at the business to Cobb police. The individual was gone on arrival of police on November 22, 2004. Cox was reported missing by his mother, and despite a lengthy and ongoing investigation, his disappearance remains unsolved. Wow. That's crazy. He was going to rob like a gaming establishment? Is that like a casino kind of thing? Gaming establishment. Sounds like a casino, right? I didn't know they had him there. Um, November 18, 2004. He was born March 13, 1966. He'd be 58 right now. Blue button-up shirt. Wow. This is probably going to have the same information. He was accompanied by another unidentified person at the time. Said he was going to the store. He'd be back in a few minutes. Six weeks after his disappearance, one of his Harley Davidson's boots was found in a wooded area near his home. Authorities believe foul play was involved in his disappearance. They received information he was planning to rob an illegal gambling establishment on the night of his disappearance, and it is believed he was killed during the robbery 
or shortly afterwards. No one has been charged in his case, however. It remains unsolved. And this is FBI. 38 at time of disappearance. Says the same thing. And this is a long thing. It says specials.myajc.com vanished. I tried to refresh it a couple of times to get it so it was better, but that's just how that shows up. I don't know if I'm going to read all this. It's really interesting, so if you want to go there and read it, it's very long. It says, How the mysterious disappearance of Sharon Lancaster's son nearly destroyed her. The woman stands behind the altar, her eyes on the congregation of a small Baptist church. Her face tightens with fear as she rubs slips of paper between her wrinkled fingers and begins to speak. I have not forgotten my faith in God, she says, but my faith in mankind has been lost a long time ago. This is Sharon Lancaster, a soft-spoken grandmother and retired caterer with bright blonde hair, and she's just warming up. She's here to talk about her oldest son, eldest son, a 30-year-old, 38-year-old carpenter who went missing in 2004. New Hope Baptist planted in the rising hills north of Atlanta in unincorporated Ackworth is a kind of home for Sharon. She spent Sundays here most of her life, but these people, her people, long ago seemed to grow tired of her pain. She came here on this chilly day in 2013 to say some things you don't normally hear in church. With a slight crack in her voice, she makes her point. I feel abandoned by my family, my friends, and also by my church. I'm not telling you this for your sympathy. I'm telling you because I'm worried about my church. The room is quiet, but for the sound of people shifting in their seats and sliding their shoes on the carpet. For nine years, I've heard stories of how my son died, she said. I've heard stories of how he was tied up and beaten by several people. I was told he was locked in a building, naked, cold, bleeding. They hung him up by his feet, cut his throat. People shake their heads, grunt in disgust. A sour look forms on the face of a young woman in the choir. She walks quickly down the steps, crosses the sanctuary, and leaves a child out of the room by the arm. Sharon continues. She recounts a recurring dream in which her son, Steve, calls out to her in the night. Help me, Mama, he begs, his voice weak, his body frail. He's in front of his mother's house, trying to climb the porch steps on his belly. Sharon tries to help him up, but over and over she fouls. Finally, she wakes up screaming. When she's done, she takes her papers from the podium and walks back to her seat. The room is silent. Sharon sits alone until a man walks over and joins her. A stranger, he whispers in her ear, telling her she is brave. This is a story about madness, the kind that can come for average people and push them to the edge of their faith in the world. It, it's about what happens to a mother when her child vanishes, when she believes people know what happened but won't talk. When she knows someone got away with harming him. It's about what happens when her daughter becomes so eaten up by her brother's disappearance. She commits a desperate act. And in the end, it's about how the mother manages to survive. Gone in the headlights. The winding, rising drive to Sharon's Lancaster house passes through the thick woods where Steve played when he was young, and along the roads he careened around in a turbocharged Thunderbird when he was grown. At the end of a dirt driveway is Sharon's ranch house with a long porch and a little garden beside it surrounded by a wire fence to keep out deer. Inside, she sits at the kitchen table. Her hot pink nail polish catches a little shine from the dim overhead light as she smokes cigarettes, drinks sweet tea, and talks about her lost boy. Stephen Lancaster was Sharon's first child, born March 13, 1966. His father was already dead, a casualty of the Vietnam War. Sharon recalls Stephen's childhood, Steve's childhood antics, how he fell down the stairs as a toddler and then got up and took his first steps, how he broke his arm, got the cast off, and broke the other arm in the same month, how he got sent home from the first day of eighth grade because they didn't allow mustaches. Her son wasn't perfect. He messed around with marijuana and pills in his mid-twenties, got 
in trouble with the law, spending occasional nights in jail and serving stints on probation, mostly for drunk driving and drug possession. Eventually, the Thunderbird set part at Sharon's house because Steve got too many tickets. But Sharon loved him. He was a kind man. He wrote poems for loved ones who died and once drew tears from the crowd at one of the rowdiest country bars in metro Atlanta with a verse about his late grandfather, and he was a loving father to his two children. Around 2003, things went south in Steve's, with Steve's marriage. His wife took their kids to live in Louisiana, and he moved in with Sharon and his stepfather, Jack Lan Lancaster. There he grew despondent. His 12-year-old daughter suspected he was getting deeper into drugs. One Thursday night, November 2004, Steve was having a quiet evening at home. He shucked some corn and prepared to grill it. Then the phone rang. It was around 10 p.m. Sharon overheard Steve tell the caller he saw headlights coming up the drive. He hung up and told his mother he'd be back after a while. He didn't say where he was going and Sharon didn't pry. Steve always came back when he said he would or he at least called her to tell her where he was. Steve walked outside down his mother's front porch steps and into the headlights. Sharon left town the next morning to pick up a grandkid from North Carolina, planning to return Monday. She checked in with Jack at home to see if Steve had come home. He hadn't no calls either. The same on Saturday. By Sunday, Jack was concerned, and he wasn't one to worry. His concern caught the attention of Steve's half-sister. Leslie Green was 36 at the time, two years younger than Steve. The two weren't especially close, and they often butted heads, but they loved each other nonetheless. Leslie didn't get along with Sharon either. Methamphetamine might have had something to do with it. The drug had become entrenched in unincorporated Ackworth beginning around 2000. Arrests for possession and distribution are not uncommon. In February of this year, a bust in the area yielded 42 pounds of white powder. This time last year, a raid on an Ackworth home uncovered what officials called the hub of a drug distribution operation that stretched throughout the southeast. Leslie was addicted, but not Steve. He was more of a pot smoker who dabbled in pills, said Leslie. But recently he had started spending time with a meth crowd and she knew where to look for him. He had been hanging around at a house in a newer neighborhood with quiet streets and cookie-cutter houses. A man named Walt Neely lived there. Neely, who moved to Georgia from New York, was a little older than Steve and out on parole after convictions related to drugs, forgery, fraudulent credit card purchases, and receiving stolen goods. His house was busy with girls and country boys partying and hanging out, says Leslie. Steve called Walt a cool cat. Leslie claimed Neely sold meth and, in fact, he later would be convicted of a crime. She went to Nilly's to question him about Steve's whereabouts, but no one would tell her anything. Nilly said Steve had been expected at a birthday party Friday night, but never showed up. Someone else said they'd received a phone call from Steve on Saturday, but that was all the information Nesley could get. Sharon's worry mounted, but she didn't panic until the fourth day when his probation officer stopped by Monday and said he'd missed an appointment. That's when Sharon called the police to report him missing. A few weeks later, Cherokee County Sheriff's investigators turned up at Sharon's store. Officers had been by several times already asking questions. Now they had information. They told Sharon they believed Steve had been planning to take part in a robbery at a gambling joint over in Cobb County on the night he went missing. They suspected he'd gotten killed along the way. Did he get killed along the way, or did he get killed there? Or on the, I don't know. Sharon already assumed Steve was dead. He wouldn't have been away so long without calling, but she felt some relief hearing they had figured out what happened. Still, she had trouble believing the circumstances. Steve hadn't been a violent man. And there was still one problem. The detectives didn't know where his body was. He could have been the lookout. He could have went with somebody that was going to do it and just been the lookout, and they could have pinned it on him. I don't know. But from the beginning, the investigation was difficult. And now I'm going to skim through it because it's a lot of reading, and you can pause it and read it if you want to, or go to the page to read the rest of it. But it's a lot. It's a lot of reading. And I'm going to scroll down. You can pause it at any time and read it if you like. 
Right here it says, early on, investigators came across a woman who said she'd driven a car to Alabama with what she thought was a shipment of drugs in the trunk. Later, she learned it might have been a body. But she couldn't say if it was a body or his body because she never actually looked to see. So she don't know what it was. Then it talks about a detective in the case. And to the mother, she thought the police were letting people get away with murder. She couldn't prove it, but she felt, at the very least, Neely knew what happened to Steve. Through the years, various detectives called Neely a suspect and person of interest and presumed homicide. Walt nearly knew what happened to Steve, they said. But we don't know. She talked to her neighbors and asked if they knew anything. She stayed in frequent contact with the police. She posted in online forums trying to find out what happened. She endured grisly rumors because she doesn't really know what happened to him because they haven't found out. So everything that she hears that's new like this might have happened to him, goes through her mind and tortures her with the thought. So she doesn't know if he was beaten or tortured or, or if any of that stuff happened. She doesn't know what happened. So everything she hears, she's going to think the worst and believe the worst. And it's a terrible for her to go through that because she doesn't know what happened. And then it says she grew close with her daughter. Because they have a common ground wanting to know what happened to him. It says Leslie got clean. And she tried to collect tidbits of information wanting to know what happened. And heard some horrific and gruesome tales. So it says she, her behavior grew more desperate. She started sneaking in people's homes as they slept. Waking them up with a gun held to their faces. Trying to get the information about what happened to her brother. Leslie and Emil acquaintance drove a white Oldsmobile to a house in the Mecca. When she arrived, she saw Carrie Gentry, a woman Leslie was convinced knew what happened to Steve, seated in her car in the driveway. So she pulled up behind her, blocking her in. And she heard Carrie was among those who had pictures of her brother being tortured beaten down to his hands and knees, burned by cigarettes, and starved. That's horrific stories, right? So she appeared by her passenger side window, holding a Smith & Wesson. Leslie got in the car and tossed Carrie's keys into the woods and told her it was time someone made an example of her. Leslie called out her acquaintance and told him to bring her something from the Oldsmobile duct tape. Wow. Leslie wrapped it over her hands, arms, and eyes, and she grabbed a hair, carried by the hair, led her to the trunk of the Oldsmobile, and ordered her inside. Before Leslie could decide what to do, someone who witnessed the act called 911. Deputies arrived to hear the pounding and muffling shouts coming from the trunk. Wow. Leslie spent a year in jail before agreeing to take a plea bargain. She was given 10 years in prison. Fifteen more on probation. Sharon had already lost her son, now her daughter. She wanted to know where her son's body was. She befriended a woman whose adult son was missing in a separate case in Cartersville. They got business cards printed with her son's pictures and words, Have you seen us? They got licenses to carry handguns. Together they would question people. Recording conversations on tiny microphones in her bra, she waited in the car with a pistol in her lap, ready for the worst. She went to Neely's old neighborhood. They'd heard Steve was killed at Neely's house on Sundown Way, that blood covered the floor in the days after, but the police said there was no direct evidence. To Sharon, it seemed like the police didn't even care. Talks about he traded email somebody. Steve Edwards traded emails with her and called once in a while to ask if she wanted to take a ride. I think that's who they're talking about. Says he was a bulldog. He was different. 
She thought there was hope with him, but in 2009, at age 57, he died. She often woke in the night to the haunting dream of her son begging, help me, Mama. Now, Neely, now freed from prison, was going about his life as he pleased. I don't know what he was in prison for, because I missed that part. Uh, she grew more despondent all the time. She and a friend of Steve's were returning from visiting Leslie at prison and had stopped at a gas station for cigarettes. Steve's friend went in the store while Sharon waited in the car. When she returned, she told Sharon that Neely was inside the store. The 67-year-old woman opened the glove box, reached inside, pulled out the gun and he emerged from the store she called his name and invited him to her car window to talk he didn't come she called again Walt it would be in your best interest if you come over here and talk to me he relented and leaned down to the window he must have seen the gun on her lap where's my son's body at she asked I don't know you know I could kill you right now where you stand now mom don't talk like that Rage boiled in Sharon. I'm not your mother, she spat. If I'd been your mother, I'd have killed you as soon as you were born. Thoughts of shooting him flashed in her mind. She wanted him to suffer the way she imagined her son had, Steve. But she didn't shoot. She watched him walk away. She doesn't know why. Her best guess is that it was grace that God made her stop because it is a sin to kill and hell is forever. A few days later, Edward Sharon's favorite detective died in his home in Tennessee. She read about it in the newspaper. She couldn't help but think the case died with him. Two years later, Neely returned to state prison for selling meth. Repeated attempts to get his side of the story have been fruitless. Around the 10th anniversary of Steve's disappearance, someone, something changed for Sharon. She decided the time had come to celebrate her son's life. She planned an event at New Hope Baptist. She invited media and politicians. It turned out to be just friends and family, but that was okay. Members of her church, church came. For so long, Sharon had felt abandoned by them, like they had forgotten her son's death. Now they shared her pain over his loss and her joy for memories of his life. A gospel group from Cartersville sang, and everyone ate chili in the fellowship hall afterwards. Sharon was ready to try, extracting some happiness from the life she had left. Taste of Freedom It's June 2015, nearly 10 years from the day Carrie Gentry lay panicked inside Leslie's trunk. Today, Leslie walks free. At 8.33 a.m., Leslie emerges. She wears blue jeans and a dark t-shirt, a dark shirt with roses on her petite frame. Her brown hair is cut short. She looks both tired and relieved. The car radio plays at Elvis Presley's in the garden. It talks about how she lost 10 years in prison. It talks about how they will go home and see Jack. Leslie will sleep in a real bed and wake up free. Sharon will wake up still with a son gone, but a daughter at home. Nobody knows. Well, some people, I'm sure there are people out there that know what happened. And to me, it seems like it's time for them to come forward with the information, you know. After all these years, why are they kill, still keeping the secrets of what happened? That was 2004. It's been 20 years. Well, in a couple of months anyway. So now we're going to look at some John Doe's. I have one in Las Vegas, Nevada. I might have scrolled too fast for you to pause and read it towards the end, so I apologize. Maybe I'll scroll back here so that you can actually be able to pause it and read it. Because I feel bad, because I think towards the end, when I got towards the bottom of it, 
I might have scrolled really fast. And then you wouldn't actually be able to pause it and read it. It's very sad. Nowadays, there's so many people on drugs that I just find it shocking and horrific. And it's an addiction. It's People are addicted to drugs. What do you do? Are you going to put everybody that's addicted to drugs and commit crimes in prison? They're, they're not getting um, healed. They need to be healed. And what are you going to do? There's so many drugs now. So many people addicted to alcohol, addicted to drugs, committing crimes. It's it, it's heartbreaking. Sometimes people get injured. They get hooked on medication. And then they get hooked on that as well. Or they get hooked on that first. And then they can't get it, so... And here's a John Doe in Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, found February 25th, 2005. Estimated age 25 to 50. Estimated year of death 2004 to 2005. Uh, measured 6 foot 1, 188 pounds. On February 25th, 2005, canoers at Lorenzi, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, pond, discovered the descendant floating in a pond. There was no evidence of trauma. Brown or black hair measured up to four inches in length. Blue pants, gray t shirt with Laughlin River Run logo, green white striped boxers, brown leather high top lace up work boot, die hard size 11 white socks. Next one we have Ruskin, Florida. Uh, it says estimated age 30 to 50, found January 2nd, 2006. Estimated PMI years, estimated year of death 0 to 2006. Um, estimated to be about 6 foot tall. Bones were found. Resident found bones brought to yard by his pet from an unknown location. And then it has this cases related to, and you can pause it and read it. It says all parts recovered near complete or complete skeleton. Left foot with deformity, DT healed fractures. The next one we have is uh, a young man found in DeLand, Florida. Forgive me if I'm not pronouncing that correctly. January 8th, 2006. Estimated age 25 to 65. Estimated to be about 6 foot 1. Remains discovered by hunters one quarter mile into the woods, just east of the listed address. I, I don't see the listed address. Remains show evidence of a single perforated, a gunshot wound, glasses, a Walkman, a backpack, which contain a wallet with no ID, an unfired FMJ, 45 caliber ACP cartridge, personal effects, purple Thrive nylon backpack, 45 caliber pistol, Radio Shack portable, alarm clock, Old Spice high endurance deodorant, brown Monday eel skin wallet, black plastic eyeglass case, um, and then it lists more things. It says this case has been ruled suicide. The age is over 25 years and the height is between 5'9 and 6'6. Six, six. Partial skeleton parts only. Pair of Converse All-Star Chuck Taylor Shorts, size 2XL. Pair of Toltec Sweatpants Navy Blue, size 2X. Wilson T-shirt, size XS, XXL. Glasses found near remains. Three pairs of sorted white sports socks. Pair of Converse All-Star Basketball Shoes, white soles with blue stripes, size 13. Next one we have is Atlanta, Georgia. Uncertain if it's male or female. Uns unsure, sorry, unsure if male or female. Uncertain of the race. 
Estimated age is 20 to 50 years old. Cannot estimate height or weight. Estimated year of death, 1950 to 2005. Estimated PMI years. Bones found by a surveyor working in the area. Bones include left uh, list of bones. I'm not going to list them all. Uh, partial skeleton parts only. And Blount, Blount, Blount or Blount County, Alabama. Found October 31st, 2005. Estimated age, 33 to 43 years old. Estimated year of death, 2004 to 2005. Estimated height says only 5 foot 6, but I'm leaving him in there. Um, on October 31st, 2005, they notified the Alabama Department of Forensic Sciences concerning bones found by hunters in Aurora area. Near complete or complete skeleton. I don't know if she delivered a body or where, so I wanted to leave that one in. Um, Wilson County, Tennessee, unidentified person. Um, male, they're not multiple races, found November 23, 2005. Estimated age 20 to 31. Estimated year of death, 2004-2005. Estimated height is only 5 foot 7. A body wrapped in a blanket along Bobo Road south of I-40 within eyesight of exit 245. So estimated PMI was one year. And that was November 23, 2005. Black hair, head hair appeared to be moderate in length, straight and black. And then there's his clothing. Um, denim jeans, waist 42, length 34. Puritan brand boxer shorts, 2840. Uh, polo shirt, burnt orange color, size XL. Uh, Converse Chuck Taylor, also high top shoes, size 9.5. Two yellow metal hoop earrings with clear stones. And there's images of the items that they found. And then Atlanta, Georgia. Estimated age on this one's 50 to 60. Male, they're not sure of the race. Body found January 14, 2006. Estimated year of death, 2004 to 2006. Cannot estimate height or weight. Partial remains found by persons exploring a creek looking for relics. And then it mentions partial skeleton parts only. Um, remnants of wrestler blue jeans. Fragment of a black belt with a metal belt buckle. White and blue king. King stone collection pocket knife. White plastic bottle opener keychain with two white metal keys. And the last one I have is Atlanta, Georgia. Estimated age, 35 to 60 years old. Found in 2013, June 12th of 2013. Estimated age, 35 to 60 years old. Estimated height is only 5 foot 2. So, you know, if that's right, there's no way it's going to be him, but I'm including it. Estimated year of death, 1963 to 2008. Um, they just found a single right femur was found by Atlanta Watershed Management performing a survey of Proctor Creek embedded in the mud. Partial skeleton parts only. It's really sad because she's never had real closure. She's never been able, you know, even if she had his remains, his skeletal remains, maybe she would be able to scatter his ashes. And they would have some sort of closure because that's really horrific that she lost her firstborn child like that. So if you have any information, please contact authorities and let them know. Maybe you were afraid to give information years ago. Um, maybe you can email them, write letters, make sure that they get the information. Maybe you can email them and CC, like the police, the sheriff's department, coroner's office, and different people to make sure that they get the information just in case 
one of the emails doesn't work anymore, or two of the emails don't work anymore, and contact them and give them any information that you have, even if it's just hearsay. It's not like you're going to testify in a court of law. You're just trying to help them solve the case. Even if you've just heard somebody drinking and talking over the years, you're not sure if it's true, you're not sure if it's relevant, you feel like it's just hearsay, give them that information. Let them have that information. Let them decide what to do with it. Take that burden off of your shoulders and put it onto theirs. Um, please don't forget to pray for his family and his loved ones. Feel free to leave comments and have a blessed day. Bye-bye.